Hi everyone, my name is Avalon Owens. I'm a fourth year PhD student in the Department of Biology at Tufts University, and I'm here today to tell you a little bit about my research on how light pollution affects synchronously flashing fireflies. So let's start with the night. The night sky is awe-inspiring and of immense cultural value. There's no better proof of that than this constellation map here. We can find so much meaning in the stars. In fact, I was looking at this earlier, and I found the outline of my talk. So to walk you through it, I want to talk about artificial light at night and its effects on insects, and then fireflies specifically, which fall at the intersection of these two topics, a special combination of light and night and insect. And then I'm going to tell you a little bit about where I spent last summer and what I did there. So about light. This is what the U.S. looks like from space at night. I'm sure I don't need to tell you that this isn't natural. These lights were put there by people. They are street lights, house lights, billboards, a whole bunch of things, which, taken all together, make it really hard for us to see those stars we just talked about. Today, over 23% of the land surface of the Earth is under an unnaturally bright night sky, which includes most of the U.S., as shown here. And if things keep going the way they have been, artificial light will eventually cover the Earth. This light is what stops us from stargazing in cities, but it also impacts people and places very far away from cities. Here is the night sky in Chacao Culture National Historical Park, an international dark sky park which the Park Service puts a lot of effort into protecting so that visitors can experience the night sky as the ancestral Pueblo peoples once saw it. This is the Milky Way, by the way. But even here, in this isolated dark sky park, the night sky isn't natural. If you subtract out the Milky Way and other natural sources of light, you can clearly see the glow of nearby cities on the horizon. And it gets worse. Even in the most remote areas, with no visible sky glow whatsoever, you still get things like this, car headlights and other point sources of light that are too small to get picked up by a satellite, but still radically alter the nocturnal environment. Now, we can't ask people to drive around without headlights, yet, but we might be able to make things better with technology, by which I mean LEDs. Now, LEDs have a bad reputation, which is fairly well deserved. As you can see here, they are often so bright and so blue-rich as to seriously offend the eyeballs. But LEDs can come in any color of the rainbow. Monochrome LEDs are usually reserved for frivolous things, but they might just be our best way of avoiding certain environmental impacts of artificial light. What sort of environmental impacts? Let's talk briefly about the impact of artificial light on insects. For more information, you can read my review paper or my recently accepted perspective piece. Artificial light can interfere with an insect's perception of time. Here is a moth that comes out at night to pollinate. When it's too bright, it decides to wait until it gets dark, and sometimes it waits forever. Here's an aphid that produces clonal daughters during the summer. The weather gets colder, but the days seem so long that it couldn't be winter, right? So it keeps doing this instead of preparing for what's to come. Whenever we worry about climate change causing mismatches in the timing of events, we should also be worrying about artificial light. Artificial light can also make it difficult for insects to navigate. Many nocturnal insects, including this cooperative study participant here, orient themselves with respect to nocturnal light sources like the moon or the Milky Way. But the Milky Way is now completely obscured in many urban and suburban habitats. So what is a dung beetle to do? Now, some moths are apparently so disoriented by artificial light that they are compelled towards light sources like lamps or windows, where they become trapped, seemingly unable to escape. About a year or so ago, this became something of a meme, and we all had a good laugh at the moth's expense, except it's not just moths that do this, and it's actually not terribly funny when you think about it. These are mayflies attracted to the lights over a bridge, swarming, mating, and laying eggs on the road. Those eggs are not supposed to be on this road, they are supposed to be in the water underneath the bridge, so this is kind of a big issue. One final issue posed by artificial light requires a bit more explanation, so bear with me. Let's imagine an herbivorous insect that comes out at night and is interested in locating a particular species of plant. Doesn't matter what plant species, I just found a lot of good pictures of this one. At night, the plant might look something like this, but under light of an unusual color, it could be almost completely unrecognizable. 
Now granted, most artificial lights aren't as intensely blue or red as those shown here, but even small differences, like between a cool white or warm white LED, could make it difficult for insects to recognize host plants' prey, predators, or conspecifics. And this could be particularly bad for fireflies, because their flashes show up really well against darkness, but are pretty easily obscured by background light. So let's talk about fireflies. These are amazing beetles that come out at night in the summer months. In North America, both the males and females are able to produce bioluminescent flashes from their abdominal lanterns, which they use to locate and court one another prior to mating. As we have gradually lit up our night and the Milky Way has faded from view, fireflies too have disappeared from many places where they were once found. The goal of my entire PhD thesis is to find out correlation or causation. And if artificial light is causing firefly declines, what can we do about it? For many years, firefly researchers have advocated the use of firefly-friendly light sources when out in the field, meaning lights of a color that fireflies can't see very well or don't react to. We just can't seem to agree on what that color is, red, amber, or blue. So one of my goals this summer was to settle that question once and for all. And to do that, I took a 10-hour road trip from here to here. This is Kellettville, Pennsylvania. There's not a lot of light pollution, not a lot of development in general, but lots of insects, including fireflies. In fact, the Black Caddis Ranch, where I stayed, has so many fireflies that every year they host the Pennsylvania Firefly Festival, which attracts people from all around the globe. All come to see my study species, the synchronously flashing firefly, Photinus carolinus. Males of this species will flash all together around five to eight times, and then they all wait hushed for about eight seconds before they begin again. It's a stunning display following a full day of fun insect-related activities that makes the $5 entrance fee really, really worth it. These fireflies come out very late at night in the deep, dark woods, so festival visitors need light to guide them to viewing areas lest somebody fall in a river or get eaten by a bear but nobody wants to impact the firefly display or the firefly habitat more generally, right? So what to do? Well, we already know that white light makes male fireflies flash less based on previous research, but there are a lot more aspects to this particular situation that we need to figure out. I wanted to know how does light affect the flash activity of synchronously flashing male fireflies? What colors of light are the most and the least disruptive? And how do those colors interact with other insects in the area, because many people have looked at the effects of light on non-firefly insects, and a few people have looked at the effects of light on fireflies, but nobody's ever looked at the two together. Until now. So here's how we did it. This is where I stayed that summer in the Black Caddis Ranch Firefly B&B. The festival happens in this backyard here, and we worked alongside this forest edge, where fireflies from the woods would spill out into the yard. We set up four plots and installed a six-foot pole in the middle of each plot, from which we suspended shielded LED floodlights of varying color, blue, amber, red, and a dark control, which were all equally bright, except for the dark one, of course, and the order of the treatments was randomized each day. Here's a bird's eye view. The path is shown on the bottom, this is the area closest to the yard, and the top of the screen is going back into the woods. The plots are extending perpendicularly from the path into the woods. If we zoom in on one plot, you can see it's divided into four subplots, which we very helpfully called A, B, C, and D. Botinus carolinus are active for about two hours each night, so for two hours each night, from 10 p.m. to midnight, myself and at least one other unlucky soul visited every single plot twice in random order, and at each plot visited every single subplot twice in random order, where we would spend 60 seconds standing there counting the number of Photinus carolinus male flash patterns produced within that subplot during that minute. We also put sticky traps underneath each light to measure how many moths and other insects our lights attracted. And here's what we found. To orient you to this graph, so on the x-axis I'm showing subplot. Remember, subplot A is the one closest to the path to the rest of the yard, subplot D is closest to the woods where the fireflies are coming from, and the light falls in between subplots B and C. The color of the bar indicates the color of the light in that plot, and the y-axis is showing the probability of observing one or more Photinus carolinus flash patterns in the minute spent in that subplot in that plot. 
Um, and we use this binomial probability because we got a lot of zeros, a few ones, and very few numbers bigger than one. So you can see in subplot A, the probability of observing a male flash pattern was pretty equal uh, in the different colors of light, except for amber was a bit lower than the others. As we move back towards the woods, the probability of seeing a male in the dark treatment increases pretty linearly, but under any of our light treatments, it takes quite a bit of a dip, probably lowest between plots, subplots B and C, and it goes back up again as you get towards the woods. Um, so we modeled this relationship with a generalized linear model using a binomial distribution and ran a marginal hypothesis test on several combinations of predictors. We found that the color of light made a huge difference in our chance of seeing male fireflies, the subplot and the plot, and interactions between the light, subplot, and plot. All of these were pretty significant. And when you compare the chance of seeing male Photinus carolinus flash patterns under different colors of light to the darkness, you see basically across all colors you're seeing many fewer fireflies, and certain colors are especially bad, so amber always is the lowest, um, and then blue is probably second, and then red sometimes appears not that bad, maybe near the woods and near the path. And here are the data we collected from our sticky traps, so these are showing the number of insects and in different insect orders that we caught in traps under the different colors of light. You can see that <laughs> we caught a lot of things, mostly flies. I was hoping it might be a little bit more glamorous than that, but it wasn't. Um, and the color of light did make a difference. We caught a lot of things under blue light, a lot of things under amber light, and more things under red light than under no light. So red light was attracting some insects, but not as much as the other two. Um, we also did catch four male Photinus carolinus fireflies, two on blue, one on amber, and one on red. All right, so what does this all mean? Oh, look! It's the constellation Lampyridae. Well, we found that light does impact synchronously flashing fireflies, and different colors of light all impact synchronously flashing fireflies, although amber is probably worse than blue or red. And that makes sense based on what we know about firefly vision. When it comes to the impact of these colors on other insects in the environment, well, they all attract insects, but red light maybe attracts fewer insects than these other two colors. If you put all these things together, red kind of comes out on top, although really darkness is the true winner. Uh, and amber definitely comes out on bottom, which is extremely unfortunate, because the amber LED is increasingly touted as the environmentally friendly solution that we've all been waiting for. Good for your circadian rhythm, good for dark skies, good for baby sea turtles, not really, but that's what we keep telling ourselves. In my personal opinion, I don't think we're ever going to find a magical color of light that only humans can see that has no environmental impacts. And I think color is a distraction from the real issue, which is brightness. Animals that can't see amber can still see an ultra-bright amber LED because color perception is all about probabilities. If an animal has a one in a million chance of seeing an amber photon and your LED headlamp puts out a hundred million billion amber photons, you do the math. If you want a long rant about that, you can DM me later on Twitter. For now, to end this talk, I'd just like to thank all of my funding sources, as well as the International Dark Sky Association, for inviting me today. Thank you.